Good morning. I'm so happy that you all made it this morning. It's kind of hard on a Friday night and then get up early, but y'all did it. So pat yourselves on the back. Before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge and um, to honor my pastor. Um, some people don't realize this, but she was my friend before she was my pastor. And so I'll call her, I'll text her, and I'll say, uh, friend Tanya. And that means take the pastor head off. <laughs> pastor Tanya, that means put, the pa- put all of Tanya. I need all the hats on. And I'm so thankful to have her in my life. Um, I was a little territorial as we started to grow. Um, We've been here, our family has been here since 2011. And I was like, who are these people coming around you? And the Lord was like, let her go. It's like, okay. So um, I am so thankful to have you in my life. Um, I am so thankful to be a part of Lifehouse Fellowship. Um, It is a place um, that you can grow. Um, And in growing, it's not always comfortable Um, But you will grow if you stay here any amount of time. And so I am thankful. Um, I'm also thankful to be um, around such mighty women of God, right? Uh, Last night, Abigail, she just flowed um, with the Father's heart. And Deborah, oh my goodness, how do you follow Deborah? Like, okay, Jesus. Um, But... What he's given me flows right in line, and that's what I love about him. None of us spoke about what we were speaking. There wasn't a, hey, speak on this or, hey, speak on that. It was just, hey, let the Lord lead you. Um, And so that is what I'm going to do today. He's given me a word, um, and I, I think it's for every woman in here to some extent. And so I just need you to tap in to his voice, and I pray Right now, Father, I just pray over your women, your daughters. Father God, I pray that their hearts would be open to your word. I pray that you'll continue to reveal yourself as you've already done this weekend. Just continue to show them who you are and who you want to be in their lives. And I just thank you right now. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Have your way. We can't do this without you. You are the master teacher. And so I ask that you would just come and speak through me um, as we enter into your word. I'm a word girl, so you're going to need your Bibles, okay? Um, But before we even begin, just kind of like Deborah, I need you to settle some things in your heart first, okay? I want you to settle in your heart that... God wants to receive glory through your life. God wants to receive glory through my life. So I want you to repeat after me. All the teachers do this, right? We love the call and response. So you're going to repeat after me. God wants to receive glory through my life. Okay, now you're going to say it like you really mean it. God wants to receive glory glory through my life. All right, so before we can even fathom that, right, um, we need to clear up some things, right? There's some preconceived thoughts that we have in our minds that we have just kind of accepted. Um, One of those is, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough for that. God can't use me. Those are, those are the thoughts that we have settled on, and we're okay with it. I'll go serve in the back, back here, because I'm not good enough to do that. I can't witness. I can't, I can't get up there and teach. I can't let God use me the way he wants to use me. Oh, no, God, not me. Go call her. And so we have to settle in our hearts that that's not okay, because the only thing that God needs from us is a yes. Once you give him a yes and you take your hands off, there are no limits to what he can do through your life. Amen? All right. So I need you to understand that he's fully capable and he's ready to move in your lives in ways that you wouldn't even be able to fathom to bring himself glory. He's not asking for you to bring him glory. If you allow him to work in your life, he's going to bring glory to himself because that's just who he is. He is God all by himself. 
He desires relationship with us, but he's not asking us to make anything happen. I know in our day-to-day lives, our husbands want us to make something happen. Go take what's in the refrigerator and make a meal. Or we're going to (laughs) Chick-fil-A. And so, but he's not, that's not what he's wanting from us. He does not want us to make anything happen. So if any of this is blowing your mind or that doubt's still kind of, kind of, um, kind of, trying to creep in, I just want to share what the Lord shared with me as I was preparing. So we're going to begin in Exodus, but before I, it's Exodus 14, but before we jump into the scripture, I want to give you a little background. The scripture that we're going to be reading, before that, Pharaoh had just released the Israelites after the plague of the firstborn. It was the last curse against Pharaoh and Egypt. So Pharaoh had finally had enough and told the Israelites, get out. Get out. We're done with the plagues. Get yourselves and go on somewhere. So they leave. And when the um, Israelites, when they left, the Lord sent them towards the Red Sea, uh, towards a road on the wilderness. So while on the road, they're going and the Lord changes their direction. The word gets back to Pharaoh and he thinks they're wandering around in confusion. And he has this epiphany of why we let them go. That's our free labor. Like, go, go get them. So he's like, go get, the, go get them. Go take them back. I take that back. So he sends 600 chariots to chase the Israelites. Okay. Here they are. They've left. They've gone into, they're free now. And now all of a sudden they look back and there's an army coming behind them. So when they figured that they were being pursued, of course, they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord for help. But also during that time, they were complaining. They were blaming. Moses, why did you bring us out here? We could have died in Egypt. There are graves there. Why we got to die out here in the wilderness? And so all along, they're not realizing that their sovereign God was orchestrating this whole thing. And so, now I do understand, right? I am not a swimmer. I'm going to work on that. Where's she at? Working on, we're working on that this summer. All right? So, in front of me, I've got this Red Sea. And behind me, I've got this army. And here I am in the middle. We're either going to die by drowning or we're going to die by the Egyptians. Neither one of them is appealing to me right now, right? So, I totally understand where they were in their heads. So we're going to pick up uh, Exodus 14, verse 13. And we're going to read a lot of scripture, so just get ready. If anything sticks out to you that I don't mention, because it is jammed, packed with things. If the Lord kind of reveals something to you, underline it so that you can go back and explore it and let the Holy Spirit speak to you, all right? But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. How easy is that? I got the Red Sea in front of me. I got this army behind me. Just stay calm. Okay. And get moving. Keep moving. I got this is what the Lord is saying. Keep moving. But how many times have we been in circumstances that seem to put us between a Red Sea and an army, and we think that we need to do something? And there's nothing that we could possibly do. We've exhausted all of our resources, and there's just nothing that seems feasible for us to do. But in moments like this, we tend to want to be like the Israelites. We want to complain. We want to blame whoever is around right? Those poor husbands get it. They get the business. When we ought to be realigning ourselves and focusing and tapping in to the trust and the faith that we have in God. So before I go any further, I just want to make sure that we understand what sovereignty means. Divine sovereignty is God's all-encompassing rule over the entire universe. Okay, Psalms 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules all over all the universe. And that's the amplified version. 
God does not need anyone else's permission. His sovereignty rules over each and every one of us. Psalms 115 and 3, the New Living Translation says, Our God is in the heavens, and he does, I love this, as he wishes. Yes, right? I'm on the side of the sovereign God, right? You should be happy if you're on God's side, all right? God's sovereignty also means he's responsible to make sure everything works out. Not me. I don't have to worry about it. All I have to do is be obedient and walk in what he's telling me to do. His sovereignty means he either causes all things to happen or he allows things to happen. Either way, he, if he causes it or he allows it, he's ultimately in control and will guide, direct, and eventually use all things according to his plan. Our part in all of this is to work with him and not against him. So he doesn't have to go around us, go through us, or over us. Let's don't get in the way, right? Just be obedient. And then we can claim the promise that's in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, I don't always understand sovereignty. There are areas in my life that I know it was him, but I don't understand it. And I also wish that he didn't do it that way. But that's not my business, right? I have to mind my own business and just say, okay, that's, not my, that's your business. I'm going to let you do it, but I'm trusting you. Okay, his thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. And once you settle that in your heart, there is this freedom that comes when you can say, I partnered with you, God. You are my God and you got this and I don't have to worry. I don't have to stay up at night. Anxiety is not going to rule. I'm not doing any of that because you are sovereign. Amen. And then you throw in free will just messes all the things up. (laughs) So my brain just stops there. And like I said, I've just learned to trust and obey. Dr. Tony Evans says it like this. God can take a little of this and a little of that and a little of the other that might not look good on their own. Yet in his sovereignty, he can mix it, stir it, stir in a little omnipresence, add some omnipotence, toss in a dash of grace, throw in a little goodness, mix a little mercy, stir it all together. And when it's all done, it's excellent. Right? Why do I want to go mess with that recipe? I'm good by myself. All right. So we're going to go uh, to verse 15 in Exodus 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, I love this. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water to the Israelites. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will hearten the hearts of the Egyptians. And they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. And the Lord there is Yahweh. Then the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but even walking through that, I'd be like, Jesus. No, no, God. 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 All right. Whoa. Okay. We're just going to keep moving. That miracle alone and walking through, can you imagine 
what they're thinking. Like, I'd be like, just keep going. Why are you walking so slow? Would you please go? <laughs> we do not know how long this is going to last. <laughs> right? Okay. That's just not me. I don't know. And they say reading the Bible is boring. I don't know. <laughs> when all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again. Then the, way, the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh, all of the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. Remember, Miss Abigail said, I've just been in awe of God lately. There's an awe about him that he will reveal to you. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So once the Israelites walked on dry land, and made it to the other side, their response was increased faith in Yahweh. Amen. And although, if you know the story of the Israelites, it may not have lasted long, but in that moment, right, we're just going to stay with the moment, they, they, they found awe, right? So when you find yourself between a sea and a raging army that's coming against you, you have to believe that your sovereign God will work it out on your behalf. And while doing so, he will bring glory to himself because no one can do what he can do. And when he does what he does, no one can take the credit. So you just allow him to be God. Amen. So that excites me, right? Because what I picture is, here it is, my enemies. It looks like I'm going to drown in the front. My enemies are behind me. He opens up a path for me. I make him through the path. But here they come with me in my path. And now I'm worried about that. But Lord, this is supposed to be for me. And then here they come because they're gaining on me. And the Lord's saying, keep moving. Let me worry about that. Keep moving. Because in an instant, what happened? the waters went back down and they drowned. So the very path that my enemies think, hey, I got her now. There's a sea in front of her and there's us behind her. There's nowhere for her to go. The Lord parts the Red Sea. They're like, oh, well, we're going to go. There's dry land. And then in an instant, God says, uh-uh, that's not for you. Go on back. And whatever happens to them is not my business, Right? That's about, that's for God. Because he wants to get glory through your life. And it's not what you're doing except for being obedient and allowing him to be God in your life. Now we're going to go to this next passage of scripture. If you ask me who my favorite female is in the Bible, I will tell you Rahab. I love her. And um, the Lord always seems to take me back to her and find every time I look at this passage of scripture and I'm like, this is there's nothing else that can be revealed from this. Lord, the Holy Spirit says, Haha, let me teach you something real quick. And that's what happened here. So I actually started with the passage of Rahab and then it took me to Exodus. So we're going to go um, to Joshua two and one. Now, this passage of scripture takes place after the death of Moses, who appointed Joshua as his, as his successor in obedience to the Lord. The people of Israel had come out of Egypt, entered into a covenant with God, spent 40 years in the wilderness for their disobedience. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? 
They were in disobedience. And what was God doing? Being God. So even if we get it wrong, ladies, even if it doesn't look like we're doing the right thing and we try because we're human and we are not perfect, he can still be God as long as we're acknowledging and we keep moving in the right direction. Now, when you turn around, that's a whole nother situation. But they were in dis, uh, disobedience and God still was God. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp to Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab. Bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you could probably catch up to them. Actually, she had, hit, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. So the king's men went. Now, that's a whole other sermon about why she lied and all the things. We're not going to talk about that today. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up to the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she said. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is in terror, living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea. When you left Egypt, and when, and we know that what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroy. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father, my mother, My brothers and sisters and all their families. Don't skim over that. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the man agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them by she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days for the men searching for you from the men searching for you. Then when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, We will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out in the streets and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on the people inside this house, we will accept responsibility for their death. If you betray us... However, we are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. And, when, and, and she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The spies went up into the hill country and stayed there three days. The men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but they finally returned without success. Then the two spies came down from the hill country, crossed the Jordan River, and reported to Joshua all that had happened. To them, the Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. So let's talk about this. Forty years after God parted the Red Sea so his chosen people could walk on dry land to avoid being captured and put back into slavery, we're introduced to this person named Rahab. Now, we can, definitely, we can speak the obvious, right? She's a prostitute. Okay. 
Well, that's another sermon for another day. But it does jump off the page, right? So when you think of Rahab, it wouldn't be unusual for you to ask, why her? Why was she chosen? Out of all the people, why was it her? Can I answer that for you? Remember what God wants from us? What does God want from us? Uh, Yes. My friends, my friend Rahab gave God a yes. And that's all it took was a yes. So don't forget how powerful your yes is. Rahab chose God from a testimony. What'd you say? Your testimony is what's important, right? Not your past. It's your testimony. God heard Rahab heard a testimony of what the sovereign God had did for the Israelites at the Red Sea and another battle. But that Red Sea was like huge, right? And in that, he revealed his power and his glory. And from there, Rahab made a heart change. So Joshua 2, 8, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the, yes, I reread things. That's how I study. So you're going to go back and read this again, okay? Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. Her statements were not laced with that with doubt or unbelief. Her statements were not laced with doubt or unbelief. She said, I knew, I know that the Lord has given you the land. There was no doubt in her mind. So if they had a doubt, they, she cleared that up real quick. Like she knows, right? So Joshua 2, 11, no wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord, your God, is the supreme God and of the heavens above and the earth below. Rahab confessed that the Lord is God of the heavens above and the earth below. And during this time, there's lots of gods. There's a God of this. There's a God of that. There's a God of this and that and that and the other. And she was like, no, no, no. There's no doubt in my heart that your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. All right. But she not only confessed with her mouth, there was action behind what she did. So she had, I don't know when in the 40 years that she was, this was revealed to her. I don't know when the Lord started working in her heart because it had to be a God thing. You know, it, she just didn't, it just didn't happen. There had to be a revelation for her. And I don't know when that happened. But up until this, by the time we get to meet her, there is no doubt in Rahab's, ha- in her mind, who God is. Okay, and so she saw how faithful God was to his people and she wanted to be aligned with that God. All right. It doesn't end there, my friends. Let's look a little further. In return for her faith in God, her confessing he is the supreme God of the heavens and earth. She also showed kindness to his people. She showed kindness to the spies by hiding them and even lying on their behalf. Joshua 2.13, when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father, mother, my brothers, and sisters, and all their families. She didn't selfishly request her own life be spared, but all of her family. Don't miss that, you guys. Before, the, before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on the people inside the house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. 
Remember when I said God wants to receive glory through your life? Rahab had heard that what God had done on behalf of his people, and I had a heart change. How many Rahabs do you have in your family? She may not be a prostitute, maybe a drug addict, maybe live in the wayward life, have not chosen God as their Lord and Savior. How many Rahabs do you have in your life? And they're watching, and they're looking, and they're listening to what God is doing in your life. They hear, they see what's happening in your life. They see the hand of God on your life. And are they at some point, this was 40 years later, are they at some point going to say, their God is the supreme God? Their God, he has to be real. What is going on with their God? How are, how are they being provided for? How are they being protected? How are they keep gaining momentum in their life? They're not living right all the time. They make mistakes. But there's something about them and this God they confess and they profess. There's something about this God. And in any moment and in an instant, they could be making a life changing decision just by us living out our testimony. See, God is able to bring glory to himself by my obedience. He's able to bring glory to himself when I don't complain. He's able to bring glory to himself when I'm not blaming others. He's able to bring glory to himself to himself when it looks like my enemies are gaining on me, when it looks like everything is against me and they're ready to destroy me. And I allow God to use my life to bring glory to himself. He doesn't need you because he's God all by himself. He wants relationship with you. And as you enter into relationship with you, he wants to part that Red Sea for you. And so through you walking through that Red Sea, he's able to bring glory to himself. And when he brings glory to himself, he's drawing men um, to him. He's drawing the lost. That's his heart. We were lost. We were lost. And we, we get excited when we say he came for the one, right, Mariah? He came for the one. Well, that one might be that Rahab in your family that we've said, I don't know about Rahab over there. I'm just going to keep doing my life over here with Jesus. And Jesus is saying, uh, go this way to Rahab. We have to allow him to use us, right? There's no one in here that doesn't want their whole family to be saved. There's not one of us in here that does not have desire for him to be to for them to be with us in glory. But why are we not pursuing them here on earth? Time is we talk about the end times. It's about this is we're living in the last days. Go get the lost. Let your life be a testimony so that you can draw men so that the Lord can draw men unto himself as he, as he brings glory through your life. Amen. I got ahead of myself. See, there's one more part that I love. I love this part of Rahab's story. Her house was built in the wall. Y'all know that wall. That wall that we all shout. We're like, yay, it came tumbling down, right? We get excited about that story. We love that. The walls of Jericho come tumbling down. But do you understand that her house was built in that wall? Not a part, there was no separation. It was built in the wall itself, right? Her house was built in the wall. And when, um, when the wall came down, her, ha her house was the only thing that was left. And this is the best picture I could find because it's in the wall. 
But it was the only left thing left standing. I lived in San Diego, y'all, right? Earthquakes, shaking the foundation. Not like these earthquakes we have here that everybody's like, did y'all feel that earthquake? I don't know if I felt that. That was my stomach. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, there are earthquakes here, and it's all because of the oil or whatever. But, um, but in San Diego, like, you're in between the doorposts, and you're like, y'all all right? <laughs> okay, so when I imagine Rahab in her house, and this wall is crumbling down, I don't know. That's no little feat. Like, I don't know. I don't know that the, the parting of the Red Sea. <laughs> Gee, God, God, he is God all by himself. Right. But I can imagine what's going on in Rahab's house at that time. She's brought her family in. I don't know the relationships they've had with, they have with her. She's the town prostitute. If you read in some um, commentaries, it's like the inn, and she's, you know, having all these people come through her house and all of the things. Um, but I can immediately hear them saying, complaining and blaming her for what looked like the end of their lives. Not even thinking about they're about to be conquered, right? No, we're going to blame Rahab. Why did we listen to you? You're only a prostitute. Why are we here? You brought us here to die. Sound like the Israelites. We could have ran. We could have hid. Why are we here sitting? And this wall is crumbling down. What is she saying? I have no doubt in my mind that she stood firm. My God will deliver us. He promised, and if he, can, if he can split the Red Sea, then he can definitely keep us safe. He promised. I can hear her becoming the preacher Rahab in that house. Amen? So then it stops, right? And they're brought out unharmed. And they were under the same covering as the Israelites. When it gets hard and everything is crumbling around you, don't lose faith and trust in your God, who is the God of all the heavens above and the God of the earth below. If you don't know this God that I speak of, It doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what they did to you. It doesn't matter what you did to them. It doesn't matter. And don't let the enemy come and fool you into staying in that place. Because God... He can do great things through anyone that by faith connects with him and accepts him as their Lord and Savior. Your life can become a testimony of his glory, just as Rahab's was. Your family, don't, don't miss this, your family can be saved by, allow, by you allowing God to come and bring glory to himself through you. All it takes is a yes. All it takes is a yes. And let's not forget that Miss Rahab, she was mentioned in Hebrews 11.31 with those of great faith. And don't forget in Matthew, she was also there in the genealogy of Jesus. So in an instant, the Lord can turn it all around. All you have to do is give him a what? A yes. And then I'm going to read it because I'm a word girl. Matthew 1, 5. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was destroyed, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. For she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Sorry, that was Hebrews. Yes. Matthew 1, 5. Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. 
Yes, my sisters, don't forget that your testimony matters. How simple or how profound, it doesn't matter. You can bring others to Christ. Revelations 12, 10 through 11 says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. I know y'all want to go eat. So I want to leave you with these four points. Number one, latch on to the fact that God is sovereign. Allow that to minister to you. Go study it out. Go pray into it. Let the, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you what that looks like, what that is. Number two, there is power in your testimony. And number three, he's waiting for your yes. And number four, through our lives, he can be glorified. Amen. Amen.